Our first question this afternoon, or, or our question has to answer time is, in Genesis 4, God tells Cain that sin is crouching at his door, but he must rule over it. Was Jesus' life, death, and resurrection necessary for us to overcome sin? If so, then why did he expect those in the Old Testament to overcome sin? Uh, we are supposed to overcome sin, and so are they supposed to overcome sin. We all overcome sin. We all overcome sin with the same tools, methods, mechanisms, powers, and resources. Uh, we, we have uh, an advantage of history and scripture that uh, Cain didn't have. But if you notice in the Old Testament, uh, how many of you had a personal visit with God and had a conversation about your struggles? Uh, God was actually personally visiting with Cain and counseling him directly about his struggles. I haven't had that personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation with God, uh, yeah, but we have the scriptures. So we all have to overcome in our life through the same resources and mechanisms. And what is that obedience? Romans chapter 1, the obedience that comes through faith or trust. We are restored to trust. And so God is saying to Cain, you've got to trust me. And you have to follow uh, like, a, like a good student, the teacher, or a good patient, the doctor. Uh, trust me, and I will lead you to apply to your life the things that you need to apply. But if you don't trust me, then your heart's going to harden, and you're going to live in fear. And this is where, where the actual obedience comes from. So we trust God. We're given wisdom. And then we're given the strength to follow through on anything he wants us to do. So Cain was going to be overcoming in the same way we overcome. I was searching the Common Reason website for content about unselfish three-way love. I remember a discussion about a husband and wife who seemed to love each other, but until the baby arrived. Can you direct me to the blog or publication? Yes, uh, just type in our search engine, Trinity, and the, I think we have two blogs in the Trinity. Read those blogs. It will be in there as a, as a metaphor or description of why three is the smallest number for truly other-centered, self-sacrificial love. At the start of Romans chapter 2, Paul writes, if you judge another, you are revealing your own sickness of heart. For the, first, for the first time, I've just considered that this may mean that when you internally assess someone, someone's sick, sin-sick flaws and weaknesses, that your own are also revealed, because all humanity share the same set of faults in deviation from our design. This would be supported by the fact that Paul just finished making strong judgments in the previous chapter. Uh, it can be unhealthy uh, and even somewhat impossible to refrain from making assessments, judgments about another. So could this indicate that we are to make judgments humbly, not that we are sinning and nasty if we make judgments about uh, another, as seems to be the prevailing interpretation in the Christian church? So what's the first question we need to ask when texts like this about judgment? What law lens, okay? We aren't to be making legal and salvation issue questions of judgment. You're good or you're bad or you're saved or you're not saved. Uh, those types of judgments are not our, our place to make. What is our place to make is to make judgments about what's actually healthy and reasonable and right. And, and uh, so I, can, I can't make a judgment about whether a smoker is going to go to heaven or not. I don't know that. Amen. I can make a judgment that smoking is unhealthy. And I also can make a judgment that that person is hurting themselves by smoking. Mm -hmm. You can always say you are loved. Right. Uh, yes, you can always say you're loved. And, and, and did, which, which of the thieves on the cross did Jesus love? Both. Oh. <laughs> so Jesus loved them both. Yes. Were they both saved? No. Get your mind around that. Yes, we can always say that but, that, but that love doesn't necessarily mean it results in salvation if the person doesn't respond to the love. Correct. Yeah, so this is, this is the part. So we make judgments, and our judgments are, are really not legal judgments. They're the judgments that you're called to make about understanding objective reality. We are to be discerning, mature people who have developed the ability by practice to discern right from wrong. What's actually right? What's wrong? Be persuaded in your own mind. And primarily making judgments and governance of yourself, how you're going to govern yourself in your own conduct, actions, beliefs, attitudes, uh, and where you're going to set boundaries with people. Just because you love somebody, and you do love them, and you have a forgiving heart to them, and they have wronged you, and they've wronged you more than once, and they keep wronging you, and you still love them and forgive them, does that mean you still give them access to your checkbook or your house or <laughs> let them borrow your car or... <laughs> But, 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 but when you don't, they tell you, they, they accuse you of not loving them anymore. 
what you do. You love them enough to not let them hurt themselves by Thank you. making those choices. Thank you. She said, but you do. You love them enough to let them be angry at you when you don't collude with their self-destruction. Right. That's what love does. And so you make those judgments all that. You're still not judging their soul. You're not judging whether they're saved or lost. You are judging that their current function is immature, childish, self-destructive, harmful, untrustworthy, and that, that you don't want to participate in that with them. And it can be misinterpreted. It certainly can be misinterpreted. And, and are we responsible for how other people interpret things? No. no. When they said Jesus is demon-possessed and a Samaritan, was he responsible for their, how they saw him? No. 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 We are responsible for how we, and much of the cor corruption in our society today, there is a, a new, there's so many layers of fantasy being taught. But one of the fantasies are, if somebody gets their feelings hurt, it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> your fault uh, if you make, if you, if, if, if you were to go somewhere and wear a MAGA hat somewhere and somebody got threatened and scared and it upset them, it's your fault. You shouldn't have wore that hat. <laughs> This is the society we live in today. People are, and, and, the, and, and understand this is right out of, right out of sin. It is, if, you, if you know what sin is, you can look at that sin operating in their life. As soon as Adam sinned, he took personal responsibility for it. No, he blamed Eve. It's her fault. <laughs> he blamed, this is what they, so when you see this blaming, I, I feel scared, I feel, it's your fault. It's the blame game. It's not looking at yourself. Now, so yes, we are to make judgments constantly about what's true, what's healthy, primarily for the purpose of how we understand the world and how we navigate ourselves through it. Okay. I so appreciate learning from you years ago that Romans 1 defines God's wrath as letting go. I notice with interest this morning that in Romans 2, Paul, after saying God let go of those who had turned to heathen ways, that he would also let go of the recipients of Paul's letters, the believers, if they didn't change their persistence and selfishness. Wow, I'm, that must have shaken them up. Not a question, sorry. Uh, well, no, not sorry, just uh, sharing. <laughs> I thought man and woman are created equal. Throughout the Bible, man can have more than one wife among other living wives. When the woman has more than one husband at a time, it doesn't look good. In the New Testament, <laughs> Jesus alludes to the Samaritan woman at the well, and she had five husbands and was now living with a boyfriend. However, the Old Testament never records God rebuking a man for having more than one wife or nor a remark by God until someone killed someone. Prophet Nathan rebukes David after he killed Uriah the Hittite. Um, Solomon had 700 wives and so on and so on. So what do you think is the design law view of this? <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, guys. It's really quite, quite, quite straightforward. What's the answer? Women are smarter than men. <laughs> Women are smarter than men. <laughs> You mean women are smart to become the 700th wife? No, I have one husband. <laughs> to have only one husband. Okay. I think one husband can only handle one wife. One, uh, one husband can only handle one wife. It's, too much, it's almost too much to handle one woman. And well, because just because they did it doesn't mean it was healthy. I mean, right. so Solomon right. had that yeah. 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 dragged him down. Because they did okay. it. You said just because they did it doesn't mean it was healthy. Oh. Look what happened to Solomon. Yeah. How, did yeah. God yeah. Yeah. How did God design it in yeah. Eden? Exactly. Okay, so, so God's design in Eden. Yeah. Yeah. One man and one woman united they did it, didn't they? in a... Equal, uh, and Eve was taken from the foot so that she'd be ruled over by him. <laughs> she was taken from the head so she would rule over him. <laughs> she was taken from the side because they were equal. Co-equals, co-authority, equal. But sin happened and God judged. What kind of judgment did God make? A judicial pronouncement or a diagnosis? diagnosis? Now that you have replaced my design of altruistic, agape, other-centered love, where you both get your total reward out of uplifting and serving the other, now that you've replaced that with fear and selfishness or survival drives, here's what's going to happen. 
the strong is going to dominate the weak, and the weak is going to seek protection from the strong. Your husband's going to rule over you, and you're going to, you're going to seek it. You're going to let him. You're going to long and chase after your husband, and he's going to dominate and control you. And that's pretty much what's happened in society. Yeah. That's, a, that's an artifact of sin. Yeah. And then in that artifact, the dominant and the control, selfishness, results in exploitation of the opportunity. And women have been exploited throughout history by men. And why, why, and so, so you say, God never rebukes. What you find is God reveals reality. Mm. You're going to do this. Did, did uh, God uh, inst- send them manna? Did they long for flesh foods? Mm. Yes. And who actually, not just let them have it, miraculously brought it? And then what happened? Did God want them to have kings? No. no. Did he even warn them about it? Yes. Who chose the first two? God. And what happened? So, so the point being is God has allowed these things to happen through history because God is the God of reality. He, he has presented his design in Scripture. Mm-hmm. We are free to accept it and live in harmony with it or reject it. If we reject it, he leaves us free. And then he records the consequences of that. Mm. There really are no good consequences with polygamy anywhere in the Bible. Mm. There's none. Solomon, not only did he marry, no, many of his, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, many of those marriages were not Solomon pursuing women. They were political marriages. Mm. He was marrying because he was head of state, and these were alliances made with other nation states through marriage, which is the pagan customs through the things. And and rather than standing for God's principles, he went along with worldly governmental customs and took a lot of these wives. I don't think it was because he was out chasing these women around the world. I I don't think that was likely. Um, But he was still corrupted by it. And, and, his, and the thing that corrupted him was he practiced religious liberty. He let his wives bring their pagan gods with them and, and set up pagan temples so they, he didn't want to coerce their consciences. You know, let, okay, we're gonna, this is a marriage of alliance with, with this other nation over here uh, that you can worship any way you want. And, and all these cult worship centers set up in, in Israel uh, because he wasn't going to coerce their conscience, which is a very biblical principle not to do. But the problem was he was bringing it into the heart of Israel through practicing governmental policies of the world rather than God's policies. So even in that one, you don't find any blessings occurring. God allows these things to happen to demonstrate by objective reality. And understand what's happening in the world today. If you're a woman, don't buy into the garbage that's being spewed by feminism in the world today. It's garbage, folks. The feminism of the world today says... Men have historically uh, been free to have multiple wives in various cultures, uh, sleep around, uh, be unfaithful, uh, have, have uh, of, uh, you know, lots of partners before marriage, not keep themselves pure till marriage. Uh, if you want to be as, as powerful as a man, well, and you want to be equal to a man, you need to go out and be just as slimy as they are. <laughs> you need to corrupt your character, sleep with as many men as you want. Uh, seriously, this is what the... This is what, Pardon? Yeah. What's good for the goose? Yeah, debase yourself, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, have as many partners as you want. Do all this kind of... This is the messaging. And then if you follow the messaging, where does it go? Destroy. Well, you can even become a man. You can get trans... You can be cha- You can have a gender reassignment surgery and become a man yourself. Or if you want to be a cat, you can be a cat. And... and <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in here about the lesson and the, and the claret jug. I, I didn't, I, I read it, whoever submitted it, I didn't really understand or track it, so I'm not going to respond to it, but I, I'm acknowledging, I just didn't understand what you're trying to ask. It says, 1 Corinthians 2.15, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged by no man. Does this... Uh, the, give direction to judge things 
like sin but not people? Yes, we talked about, I think, this already. This is the point that you are to exercise your judgment to judge what's actually true, right, reasonable, healthy. And I tell my patients, that's the, that's, you ask, there's a series of questions if you're trying to figure things out, and you have to have a certain understanding of reality, but is it right? Is it reasonable? Is it healthy? So you can do something that's right, or it's or, or something that's it's neither right or wrong. Is it right or wrong for me to buy that pair of shoes? It's not written. It's not, it's not a sin to buy them. It's not a sin not to buy them. It's neither right nor wrong. Is it reasonable? Well, they're they're nine hundred dollars. It's not reasonable. They're only twenty nine dollars, and they're really pretty, and I really like them, but they're a size and a half too small. <laughs> That's well, not healthy. No. Right, reasonable, and healthy. Is it right, reasonable, and healthy? Right, reasonable, and healthy. See, not, not every, every decision hits all three of those. But it's, is it right? Is it right or wrong? And that right or wrong can be morally right or wrong in harmony with God's design laws, uh, or it could be societally right and wrong. Is it right or wrong to go 35 in a 30 zone? <laughs> Well, that really depends. You're taking your wife to the hospital as she's uh, precipitously delivering your child. Or your, your, your brother's having a heart attack and you're taking him to the hospital. Okay? It really does depend on that one, doesn't it? If it's right or wrong. Yeah. So this one says, um, how much of Christianity's interpretation of the Revelation term mark And I, the sentence structure here, sometimes things come through as, as they're written, <clears throat> means when, what does it mean? I guess when the ancient Greek word mark, and the ancient Greek, and it's, it's actually laid out here in the Greek, and then the, the, the English <coughs> letters for the Greek are charagma and character. Character. Okay, which is basically, yes, it's K H A R A K T E R. Character. That's the Greek for mark. When you're marked, the mark of the beast, you get the character of the beast. Oh. Interesting. Okay? It says, where have the theologians with their divinity degrees and Greek linguistic students been on unsettling the, and helping us understand the, the, the answer to this question? I, I don't know where they've been. I, 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 I will have to check because I'm unaware of what you just said, too. It's not, nothing that I've ever actually looked at in the Greek myself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home and check that out. So that's an interesting point to check. Is there, a, is there a pamphlet of the scripture examples where there seems to be translation issues? Yes, you can just go online and there's, there's lots of things been written over the years about mistranslations in the Bible where things have been, um, you know, uh, and this is where you can compare version to version. And sometimes it's not necessarily mistranslation, they just don't know what it is. This is in the preface to our Remedy Psalms, I point out that there are plenty of places in the Old Testament Hebrew where all the lexicons say Hebrew uncertain. Hebrew, Hebrew not known. <laughs> and what do they do? They guess. They guess. And so there, there's a lot of that that happens um, you know, throughout some of this. It's, uh, the uh, Hebrew is much more vulnerable to that than the Greek. But if you're looking for places that are, that are everybody kind of agrees this is, this is you know, mistranslation, there are lots of little books out there that have done that over the years and more. I think there are 600, there's a book on the King James where 600 words uh, in the King James uh, have changed meaning since 1611. So in 1611, it meant one thing. If you read the King James today, you'll get a totally different meaning, and it doesn't mean that they were wrong in their translation. It means that the English word has changed meaning. And examples would be like uh, let or prevent. prevent. Uh, if, you, if, if somebody's playing tennis and they get a let ball, that's, that's not a net ball, it's a let ball. The ball has been hindered. So in the King James English, when you let something, uh, when something is let, it is hindered or held back. Okay, today if we let it, we allow it or permit it. And in the King James, prevent meant to proceed. So, uh, and today, prevent means to hold back. And so these words, there's like 600 or more words in the King James that have changed meaning, almost the opposite direction from where they meant then. And so you can get mistranslations. So you read in the famous text in Thessalonians about um, Paul encouraging um, the uh, believers about those who have already fallen asleep, uh, and that we which are alive will not prevent those who have... Um, 
who have already fallen asleep in Christ. We won't prevent them. We won't precede them. That's what it says in the more modern translations. We won't go before they go. Okay? It's like, what are we going to do? Hold them down in the grave? We're preventing them? Okay. But isn't this a cause for people to feel that the, what, that the Bible's not can't true? Be you know, it's so, it's so full of, riddled with these issues that why, how can you know you're, what you're believing is true? Yeah, and so that's why you have to read widely and read a lot of versions instead of yourself. And this is the reason why the Bible is written the way it is. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Which way do you learn math? A math book where you open it up and it's an answer key and you get all the answers. But there's actually no problems to solve. No. Or a math book with a lot of problems and few answers. And you actually have to figure out how to solve them to get the answers. The Bible is written in a way that requires you to exercise your God-given reasoning abilities to search out and study so that you come with comprehension and understanding. Just memorizing an answer key, and even if the answer is right, there's 28 math problems on the test. <laughs> and you memorize the answers, and the answers are right. Do you know how to do math? No. The 28 fundamental beliefs, and here they are. And you memorized them, and they're all right. And you can give the answer in your Bible doctrines test. Do you have any clue what's going on? No. Not necessarily. If you don't know why, those are the right answers. And that's the reason the Bible's written, because it's not enough to know the answer. You've got to know why it's the answer. So blessed are the wise. Why? W-H-Y-S. The wise. And it was written by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and as we seek, just, yeah. The Holy Spirit the enlightens. Holy Spirit. Okay. Why is there a 500 character limit on the questions for, the, for, our, for our website? <laughs> Is this an arbitrary come and reason rule or a software limitation? <coughs> because we want questions. We don't want pontifications. We don't want sermons. We want questions. Okay? We, don't want, we, don't want, we don't want little mini books and papers. We want questions. That's why we put a limit. If you can't make your question in 500, 500 uh, in, which is about a paragraph, okay, so... Is Isaiah 53.10 a possible fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 promised? Uh, New King James Version capitalizes him, which implies Jesus, and not Satan is being bruised by God. Yes, if it is. That's exactly what it is. Jesus is the one who's being bruised, and he's not being bruised by God. Um, but uh, Genesis 3.15 is the, the, if you notice, both are being wounded. Satan, uh, the, the seed is crushing the serpent's head, where the serpent bruises the seeds heal. And so, yes, Jesus is bruised or wounded in order to achieve what I said in class, uh, destroying all the things he had to destroy. There was only one mechanism or way he could accomplish that. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for Jesus and all that he's accomplished for us. Give us greater understanding, wisdom, discernment. Help us put the pieces together and not just understand it in our heads, but to experience your kingdom in our hearts that we can live as you would have us live. We pray in your holy name. Amen.